still remember all the Wiggles songs. Truth is out, anyone? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'll be working out of the old duct tape Bible this afternoon, or this morning, excuse me. Um, it's on page 729, if you're interested. Um, so this is one of the, the central teachings and one of the most important things that Jesus ever taught people. And, you know, it's an important con passage that we understand within our own context, but I think it's important to understand the context that it came from. Now, Jesus is, is teaching a crowd that will eventually... Um, leave him and, and turn on him. They will actually call for his blood. Now, when we understand this passage, we sometimes think about the guy who didn't give our leaf blower back, or the neighbor who drags their trash cans in um, at 2 a.m. in the morning. And yes, I have someone like that. But that's not really the context of, of what we're talking about here. When, you talk at, when you're talking about a, a group that is calling for your blood later on, it adds a lot of context for this. I was reading a little bit about um, some examples of this. If cancer was a person, could you forgive cancer for killing your wife, or your husband? Could you forgive someone that came into your house and burned it down, or God forbid, hurt one of your family members? It adds a lot of context to the passage. Luke 6, 27. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect for payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Well, it's great to see everyone this morning. It's always good to feel the better weather coming, where it's nice and cool and just a little bit warm and lots of good things going on. So I'm glad all of you are here. I would just want to say also be very careful right now. It seems like there's more and more people that are closer and closer that uh, are at risk and getting disease. So just be careful with each other. This has got to be one of the hardest passages because it is so simple and so easy and uh, so difficult. As we're talking about conforming to the heart of Jesus, though, this is one of those passages that really is the heart of Jesus. It really is what Jesus is all about. And I hope we understand this already. And I think sometimes we have a difficult time deciding to be able to teach or to live what we teach because that means that we're going to have to teach something difficult. And so the best thing to do is back off on what you teach. Teach something real easy. Teach that it's just simple. In fact, we're hard to press to teach anything at all because we haven't even really decided what we believe. We don't even know what we think. You know, well, what do the elders think? What does the church believe on? And you'd be amazed at how many times I get the question from Christians who are members here, well, what does our church believe on? I'm like, well, what do you believe? Isn't it the fact that we are the ones who have faith and that we are the ones who are to respond to God? And so what is it that we believe? But that's what they seem to be asking. Now, what do I think about this? And well... <laughs> Hopefully, you're going to come to some better conclusions with that. And when you believe something, and when you teach something, it is 
hard to live up to that. The context that he's talking about here in Luke chapter 6, as John was saying, is some of the crowd that is around and he's been trying to teach right before this is the Luke version of the Beatitudes. And so the Luke version of the Beatitudes is blessed are the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the hated. That doesn't seem to be a very good position to be in, to be in those categories. But he says, you're going to have a a kingdom, you'll be satisfied, you'll laugh, and you'll be accepted. Well, if you have that to look forward to, then, okay, I can stand to be in one of these. But in Luke's version, he also goes to the other side and pronounces the opposite. And so he says, woe to you who are rich and full and laughing and complimented, you already have all the blessing you're ever going to get. There's nothing better coming. In fact, it looks like it might get worse. Well, certainly we want to be on the first one of those. Oh, wait. We wanted to be poor and hungry and weeping and hated? Well, And so it gets to be a little bit difficult even trying to set up, but that's what he says going into this. Recognize that when things are not good in your life, that may be a time to rejoice. That may be a time to think about the good things of God they are going to be coming next. And I think we have to have that before we get to this next part. And he says, I say to those of you who hear which I find an odd phrase, because obviously there are some people who don't hear. Obviously, there are some people who are not going to be looking at what he says. So the passage is in Luke 6, 27, I say to those who hear, and then he gives us all of these things that are really difficult. Do good. Love your enemies. All of those things seem so hard for us to do. He also says, I want you to recognize that there are some people that you're not going to get along with. And that's just kind of the basis for this whole thing. Uh, If you have no enemies, if you have no one who hates you, if you, well, then maybe you're just not trying hard enough. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, you must be a great person, but uh, Jesus doesn't even get that good. And so I think we have to recognize there are people who are going to disagree with us. There are people who are not going to like us and not appreciate us. And what he says is, I want you to look at the way in which you approach those people. But first of all, let's talk about the people who are our friends. So the people who are our friends, are we going to do things that are good for them? Well, yeah. Because they're our friends. And so we're going to do things that are good for them. When you look at this other group of people, he doesn't say that those people are in need. He says they're enemies, they want your coat. Uh, But as you look at this, I think it maybe suggests that there is a need there, that they're not just coming around saying, give me your coat so I can torture you. I don't see Jesus in that kind of a situation either. And as Jesus teaches, certainly he is going to live what he teaches And we don't see him in that kind of a situation where somebody just says, oh, give me all your money. Well, at least that didn't get written down, but that seems not to be the case we're talking about, is that someone is just going to say, I'm going to take everything away from you. Rather, he's dealing with a situation where he says it's good to give in a general way. It's good to be generous to people. It's good to treat people as good. Back in this time, there was a way of dealing with those who didn't have as much. They were able to beg. It was recognized that it was a good deed to give alms to people. And so this was the way in which they helped each other. And Jesus is saying here, make sure you take advantage of that opportunity. We see as Peter is going to the temple, a guy who's been sitting outside the gate of the temple begging for years, and everybody seems to know him and have seen him, and well, yeah, that's what he would do, and it's almost like what he's supposed to do. 
that's the way in which their society had of doing those things. And so they are able to give to him. And this may be a lot of what he's saying, except go that extra place because it's not just somebody who has need. It's somebody who hates you. It's somebody who doesn't even like you. And so as we look at this, he's giving us all kinds of things that we are to do to people who are difficult. So love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And so he's responding to these same kinds of people. He's saying be generous and respond to people the way that they respond to us. That there is this give and take in life, and I think we understand that. We see that. We recognize that. We do this with our friends. You've heard the phrase, if, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. Or you scratch my back. I'm not sure what back scratching has to do with any of that. But it just simply means that we're going to get along. We're going to give to each other. We're going to understand how this works. If you love me, I love you. If you do good for me, I'll do good for me, for you. Do a favor, and I'll owe you one. We say that sometimes. But Jesus comes out saying, expect nothing in return. Well, that's a whole different thing. Expect nothing in return. And so he teaches this about the people who are the worst in your life. Not trying to do with those who are good friends that certainly would do all of these for them, but then about the people who are the worst that we would love and do good and bless and pray and not retaliate, that we would give freely, that we would treat others the way that we want to be treated for the enemies and the hated and the cursed and the abused and the people who hit you and the one who tries to take away. And I think what he's trying to say is that you would do this for good people. I want you to clear out all the distinction lines. That's not a matter of saying, well, just good people I'm going to do these good things for. He says, we're going to do these for friends. We're going to do these for enemies. We're going to break out the distinction between those. Because it was very much taught at that time that that's the way it was supposed to be. And if you look at the Matthew section of this, you're going to see that's exactly what it was. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. And Jesus is trying to say, I want you to do this for everyone. No more friends and enemies. No more racial lines, no more dividing into groups, no more sinners and saints. I want you to do these for everyone. Well, why would we do that? Well, just in the logical sense of things, hatred brings more hatred. We always think, well, we'll get in the last word. You know, that'll teach them. We'll get in that last word and it'll straighten them all out. Or that's what they deserve. And there is never a last word. It just seems to go on and on and on, and then you feel like you need to say something else and do something more. What you give, you will get back, and that's the principle he's trying to say here. So the question becomes, what do you want back? And it's not what others give to you not how others have received you, it's what you did. And they don't appreciate it, and they mistreat you, and you say, but I did something good. I'm supposed to get back something good. Well, the get back is going to come from God. It's probably not going to come from them because they are an enemy. They are someone that hates you and doesn't like you and doesn't appreciate you. And so you're not going to get it good coming back from them. But God is going to be back, and God is going to be nice, and God gives back to you. Sometimes we call this karma. Uh, you know, what goes around comes around. All these, you know, wise sayings that we have, and how far around the circle is it? But you understand what I'm trying to say. It isn't always true, but God is watching and saying, I will make it true. 
And we may not be able to depend on a natural order of the world saying that, well, you know, what goes around comes around. No, but God is saying, I will enforce it and make sure that it does. When you do something good, it is something that comes back to you. There will be a reward given for this kind of behavior. And so as you look at the last part of this, he talks about loving those who love you. What benefit is that to you? There's a lot of benefit to that, isn't there? That's one of the greatest things that we have is to love somebody and for them to love us back. There's a tremendous amount of benefit to that. Otherwise, you go around and nobody cares. That's not a good situation. We get so much out of the fact that we are able to love someone else and that they can love us back. That's what marriages are based on. That's what friendships are based on. And so would we do good for those people? Well, of course we would do good for those people. Would we lend to those people most of the time? We would even lend to those people because we already love them, we care about them, we want something that's good for them. He says, even sinners do that. I'm like, well, yeah, but, and that doesn't make us better. And he says, what I really want is for you to do that to enemies and expect, expect nothing in return. And that's where it becomes a lot harder, doesn't it? But he says, your reward will be great. You will be considered to be sons of the Most High because God's grateful to the, and God's merciful to the unmerciful, to the ungrateful, to the evil. And so be merciful like God. Be loving like God. And it doesn't matter what the other people are like. And so what reward do we get back from God? Is it direct deposit? Does it just show up in your account? Or does it come in gold bars? Or what reward do we get back from God? And I think maybe that's where we struggle because sometimes the reward we get back is a spiritual reward. It means your life is full. It means you're satisfied. It means there's a blessing and you feel blessed. Well, I want a bigger reward than that. How else are you going to get that? You cannot have enough stuff to be satisfied or to feel like your life is full and complete and blessed. Would those be okay? If you feel like, I've got absolutely everything I need, I have friends, I'm loved by people, it's great. Our fear, on the other hand, is I think people are going to come and take away everything I got. Is that what Jesus is trying to say here? Is this just permission to steal and to abuse? And I don't think that's the intention of Jesus at all. I saw this. He said, appreciate those who love you. Serve those who need you, forgive those who hurt you, and thank those who help you. And maybe that helps give us a little bit of a better idea. He isn't even considering the fact that, you know, this is going to completely destroy you. Although when we look at the example of Jesus, it was painful. It was difficult. But it was difficult because of choices he made. These are general attitudes, love them, do what's best for them, do good, lend. That's kind of the big one, isn't it? I mean, we can get past the love them, okay, I'll love an enemy you know, from over here, not over there. They have COVID after all. We'll do good, all right. You know, we'll do something that's good for them. But the lend, you know, and knowing you're never going to get it back. And what does he mean by that? Lend, and they may not return it. But I want you to think about your friends for a minute. And when you lend to your friends, do your friends bring it back? 
chances are you've lost more to friends than you ever have to enemies. And let me just go ahead and confess, I'm one of the people guilty about this. And so, if you and all of your good intention and love at some point in the past have loaned me a book, for example, and I have a whole shelf full of books, and I don't remember who gave me what. And so, it's not really an intentional, well, I'm never giving that back to them. It's a, wonder where this came from. (laughs) And so, maybe you can say something to a friend and get it back. And the difference is, I'm not going to say anything to an enemy because they're an enemy and they're not giving it back because they hate me. You still lost it either way. And why are we so worried about that? Because our friends are going to do the same thing to us. Pray for those who hurt you. Does it hurt to pray for an enemy? Well, sometimes it might be difficult, but I'm not sure it's painful. Love. Does loving someone who hurt you, does that hurt when they were mean to you? The answer is yes, it does. It hurts a lot, but it's much better than being afraid to love anybody, not ever being emotionally invested in anyone and not ever, no, that's much worse. Giving when they don't appreciate it, well, it's gone anyway. And maybe they tear it up, and maybe it was precious to you, and you thought you would give them something that is great and precious, and they just don't appreciate it at all. But you gave it. And so, even if they destroy it, you gave it. It's still gone. And yeah, it may hurt a bit, but God sees all of these things. Is that the worst that there is? God sees our giving and our loving and our praying and our lending, and God appreciates it. And that's what he's trying to say. So understand what I think he's trying to get at here. There are ways in which we treat people we like and people we love and people who are friends. And what he's trying to say, there are some things you wouldn't even do for a friend I'm not sure he's saying you have to do those for an enemy. Do the things you would do for a friend and do those to enemies and to people who hate you. Treat everyone the same. And I don't see this as a passage where he's saying, you know, you you can treat people who like you and people who are friends, but you know when an enemy comes, you've got to treat him better than you ever would any friend. No, I don't think he's saying that. I think he's saying you ought to treat everyone the same. Now, should we treat people better? Yeah. We might ought to treat everyone better. But not just because they're enemies and because there's a command here. We just haven't done a good job of eating, treating our friends very good. Some things we don't lend to anyone, friends or enemies, because it's precious to us. Well, don't lend it. He isn't saying lend an enemy what you would never lend to a friend. He is saying treat everyone the same. Be good and loving and patient and kind. Do not be a grouch. Okay? That part is not in here. And the more we are able to love our friends, the better we are able to love enemies. My real question is, Are we even good at loving our friends? And that maybe we need to do a better job of that. All right, so maybe we really need to understand what Jesus' life was like. And I know this is a backwards way, and it's just because I'm a weird person, okay? But when you think about Jesus, he lived what he taught. So how did Jesus live Luke 6, 27? How did he do that? Because his life was not easy. So when we go back and look at the enemies of Jesus and the encounters that he had, 
I want you to think about this for just a minute and look at what Jesus did. So in Luke chapter 11 and verse 37, while he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. The guy just asked you a dinner. Why are you jumping all over him? Well, because he thinks you should have washed, and this is not just, you know, to wash off the COVID or whatever disease is around. This is the ceremonial washing where you have to dip your hands in the right la laver and, and lift them up in this certain water, and the water has to run off at the elbow, and then you would be ceremonially clean for, and Jesus says, no, that isn't part of it. Now, wash your hands, yes, but it, that's not what's at stake here. And he's trying to get to the Pharisee and saying, you need to look at who you are because you're just washing the outside and doing all this ceremonial stuff and your heart isn't right with God. Can Jesus challenge that person? He does. Whether he's a friend or whether he's one of the Pharisees who very often were seen as enemies, Jesus can challenge that person. He calls him full of wickedness. He calls him a fool. I thought he said we couldn't call anybody that. We can call him other stuff, right? But don't. It's Jesus. You've got to. This is how Jesus loves. Who's he trying to love? Well, the guy's at risk. He needs to straighten up his life. Verse 42 of Luke 11, Woe to those who pay attention to details and neglect the justice and the love of God. Verse 43, Woe to those who look for the best seat. They're so arrogant. Verse 46, Woe to the lawyers who make salvation difficult putting a burden on top of everyone else. Verse 47, woe to the accusers and the people who have been killing the prophets and have this attitude of doing away with the righteous people, those who hated correction. Luke 12, he says, beware of the teaching of the Pharisees to his disciples. Well, is that really a loving response? And sometimes we don't think of it that way. But this does not mean letting somebody walk over you. And sometimes it means standing up for something that's right and being able to speak up and say, this isn't right here. And of course, the one in John chapter 2, this actually happens twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables and he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Is that loving and giving? Is he contradicting Luke 26, 27? It happens twice. He even makes the whip of cords. He overturns the tables. He drives them out of the temple. Who did Jesus love then? He loved God. And he was doing good. He was doing good for the people that were being kept out of the temple. He was doing good for those being cheated by the Pharisees. He was doing good, 
And he was a blessing to those who really wanted to worship and were not able to. And sometimes extreme love shows extreme dedication. And I find this principle to be true. The strongest against sin is often the most gentle against sinners. And I think we have to recognize that, that it is not being strong against sin and not the fact that we're going to just give in to everybody and let them do everything and let them take everything and not stand up for anything. That was not Jesus. But to those people who are suffering, to those people who need love, it doesn't matter if they're a friend or an enemy, sometimes the most violent are the ones who hate. And they hate everybody. They don't just hate you, they hate everybody. And they're looking for someone with some kind of compassion and love to be able to reach out to them. In Luke 8, 23, so we see this whole thing about how it works and how he's able to do these things. We see in Luke 8, 26, he heals a man with demons. He has a legion of demons. That's a lot. But then they go into the pigs and they all run down and they're drowned in the sea. And uh, is that being good? Seems like the people are pretty mad. You got some enemies now. You just destroyed the economy. But that is actually doing good. He saves a man who has demons. And for every good deed that you try to do, you may make somebody else really upset and really angry with you. And so you're going to see that kind of response. And the rest of the people send Jesus away because we don't want you around here if you're going to love people like that. He heals the people in front of him, but very often he leaves when they're looking for him. It happens a couple of times. In Mark 1, you're going to see Jesus, after he's done miracles that night, he leaves while people are looking for him, and the disciples and come, and, and they say to him, everybody's looking for you because you can bless them, you can give to them, you can do for them, you can. And he says, I'm not doing it. How can you say that? Luke 6. He says, because I have more people to reach. He's saying he has a schedule? What? But sometimes that's the mission. And as you look at that, it's, it's not saying that he's not loving because he's loving the next ones and the people of you could stay there forever, I guess, with one. As he's coming back from Jerusalem, they want him to stay with them. And, and if he's not going to stay with them, then they're not going to let him stay in town. And he says, fine, I'm going. I'm not doing miracles for you. How can you say you're loving when you're not doing miracles for us? We need, we want, we demand. And that is not Jesus Did Jesus live what he taught? Yeah. And we have a very clear example of what that teaching means. It means stand up for God and love and lend and give and pray and do good for people because Jesus would give his life And he gives his life for enemies, and he gives his life for friends, and he gives his life to make friends, and how we love is powerful, and how we pray is powerful, and how we give is powerful, and how we lend is powerful. It makes a difference in the lives of other people. And yet I find sometimes we treat friends like enemies. When you sign on to Facebook, they give you a list of people that you can get that are friends, right? Where's the enemy list? 
Do you ever wonder that? I mean, where's the list of enemies? How do I put that? Because it looks to me like when you look at all the comments and all the people on there, there ought to be an enemy list here somewhere because not all these people qualify for the friend list. But he's trying to say, no, that's all you've got. You're going to treat them all the same. And yet, sometimes we want to make those kind of distinctions. You look at somebody else's list and you can say, well, we have this many mutual friends. How many mutual enemies do we have? (laughs) But no, that's not the way to look at it. We don't need to be mean people trying to avoid having to live up to what we teach. Maybe we could do a better job with enemies also. The rest of Luke 6, the rest of the chapter, looking at the context. In verse 37, verse 37, he says, don't judge. Because remember, you're going to get back what you give. And so if you judge, people are rightly going to judge you. If you judge, God is rightly going to judge you with exactly the same judgment you give. And so, save yourself some headache. Don't judge, and you won't be condemned. In verse 39, he says, don't worry about how other people look and about the sin in their life or the speck in their eye. He says, you might need to look at your own and spend much more time judging yourself and looking for the faults that you have rather than how you're going to treat somebody else. It, it, it's the balance, right? What you would look for in somebody else, certainly if you're able to help them, you're able to help them, but never do that without looking at yourself first. The good and the bad tree, verse 39, you're going to see the Good and the bad tree, actually it's down in verse 43. Every good person brings good treasure, or out of his good treasure produces good. Every evil person out of his evil treasure actually produces evil. What an amazing thing to think about. And he says it's going to be based on how you lived, on what you did, on the way you responded to people. This is powerful. So we wonder sometimes why people don't listen to us when we try to teach. And I think it comes down to this one thing. To be a better teacher, you need to live a better life. That's it. Before anyone is going to pay attention, and before you're able to say anything, whether it's a judgment or a speck or a bad fruit or whatever, you need to live a better life. And then God blesses, and God does. Give, and it'll be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What a great thing that is. Or maybe that's the worst thing you've ever heard. Because you're thinking about all those things that you said and all those things that you did. And what, those are all coming back on me now? Yeah. We need to live a better life. It's got the coffee beans there. The beans aren't very good, right? Not until they get you know, ground up and pressed and poured in and hot water run through them. And then the coffee's pretty good. The life after you've gone through all of these difficult things with the enemies is pretty good. Look at what God gives. And God does some great things. So sometimes I think we have a hard time teaching because... We have an even harder time living. Can we just act it out for them? This is what Jesus said. Let me act it out for you. And we 
understand what it means to love Jesus. And we do that when we repent and we surrender to Jesus and we surrender to others. And it starts by the way that we live our life and it starts by our baptism and our repentance and our way we act it out when we apologize and when we forgive and when we realize I'm just going to love the next person I meet no matter who it is. It might be a friend and it might be an enemy, but I'm going to love the next person that I meet. What a great way to look at the next person. I hope I'm the next guy you meet. (laughs) Wouldn't that be great? We have so many blessings to be in Christ. And God just pours into us because of the life that we live. So that's the challenge. Be a better teacher. Live a better life. If we can help you draw closer to God today, we want you to come. We can pray with you. Please come while we stand and sing.